Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a KPBS I News Source investigation is raising questions about political ads in the UT San Diego, what a state commission is now doing about it. I'm Peggy Pico. Also coming up, Mayor Bob Filner joins us with an update on City Hall with details on the tourism marketing agreement, Balboa Park, and Donna Fry's new job. Then, 50 years after the Federal Equal Pay Act passed, women in San Diego and throughout the nation still earn less than men for the same work. We'll find out why and what you can do to close the wage gap. Also tonight, the deaths of two women who left lasting legacies, one on the world stage, the other on the silver screen. And should baby food jars come with a... KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by... Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. California's Fair Political Practice Commission says it's reviewing reports tonight. UT San Diego may have violated campaign election rules. The agency wants to know if the newspaper offered an improper discount on political ads during last year's primary election. KPBS reporter Mitha Sharma says the inquiry comes after an analysis of political ads last fall by the iNews source KPBS Investigations Desk. Longtime campaign guru Tom Shepard grew suspicious by the day, flipping through the UT San Diego last fall as he saw ad after ad blasting his client, Democrat Bob Filner, who was running for San Diego mayor. When I started seeing the ads from the other side running as often as they did, it made me wonder because if, if they were paying $8,000 an ad, they were spending an enormous amount on newspaper advertising. The $8,000 per full page is what Shepard said he was quoted by the UT. The iNews source KPBS investigations desk audited ads in every paper last fall and checked campaign finance records. The UT may have offered the anti-Filner campaign a bargain. Financial documents show San Diegans for reform in opposition to Bob Filner paid $1,560 each for 16 full page ads. UT Chief Executive Officer John Lynch wrote in an email that all political ads were part of a bundle option available to every campaign, but he refused to sit down for an interview. The paper endorsed Filner's opponent, Republican Carl DeMaio, who ultimately lost. Shepard says the UT discounts are unprecedented. I've seen newspapers and radio and television stations uh, editorialize in favor and against my candidates before, and I just kind of accept that as being part of the game in, in political campaigns. Uh, I've never seen advertising given away to one candidate in preference over another. Former California Fair Political Practices Commission Chairman Dan Schnur says at the very least transparency is required. If the news organization did not offer the same rates to each candidate, then they're providing a fin an opportunity to one candidate that wasn't available to the other. That means they're providing a financial level of support to one candidate that they did not provide to the other. And that's perfectly allowable. But Schnur says the discount must be recorded as an in-kind contribution. Yet there is no record of such a contribution from either the UT San Diego or its owner, Doug Manchester, to the anti-Filner committee. Federal election laws are stricter and the UT may have also violated those rules last fall. The paper ran 27 full-page ads in support of Republican Brian Bilbray in his unsuccessful congressional race against Scott Peters. Bilbray reported paying $25,000 to the UT for those two dozen ads. Marianne Pintar of the Peters campaign says the UT offered her a rate of $24,000 for three full-page ads. Pintar smelled a deal for Bilbray. It just didn't make sense to me or to us uh, to spend as much money as he would have had to have spent uh, based on the numbers that we were quoted um, to be running those full page ads and um, the UT, um, we, we knew that the UT was not our friend and that they were very strongly behind uh, Mr. Bilbray 
uh, from the, on the editorial side. Editorial endorsements are fine. Special pricing is not, says former Federal Election Commission Chairman Trevor Potter. It's not permissible under the federal election laws to offer a discount, period, to federal candidates. For the KPBS iNewsource Investigations Desk, I'm Amitha Sharma. And we have a full list of the political ads from the UT and the related campaign finance reports all at kpbs.org. San Diego's winter homeless shelter for veterans was scheduled to close this morning, but KPBS reporter Susan Murphy tells us a last-minute reprieve is keeping the doors open. This big tent on Sports Arena Boulevard has been home to 150 veterans for the past three months. The city-funded annual winter shelter is usually open 120 days from December through the first week of April. But the issue of extending it started last month. That's when city officials announced they were keeping the downtown winter shelter open for the general population for an additional three months using $300,000 of surplus funds. Homeless advocate David Ross says he met with Mayor Bob Filner to tell him that's not fair. I took five of the veterans here uh, with me to plead to him to please recognize these 150 veterans as you've recognized the downtown population. One of those homeless veterans is Michael Pivido. He says he told the mayor when the shelter closes, he'll not only lose his bed and three meals a day, but also his lifeline of medical, housing, and employment assistance. One of the obstacles I've found here is if you're not a drug or alcohol, if you're not addicted to drugs or alcohol, you have very, you have almost no resources at all. Pivido says he's on waiting lists for permanent housing that are two and a half years long. In the meantime, he says he's hopeful after meeting with the mayor. He assured us that he was going to do everything in his power to make sure that we were able to stay. The Veterans Village of San Diego is funding the shelter for two more weeks until the city makes a decision on whether to keep it open longer. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. As you heard, Mayor Filner made a promise to San Diego's homeless veterans. Earlier today, he spoke with Eric Anderson to explain where the money will come from. Over the weekend, San Diego Mayor Bob Filner told the Veterans Village not to pull down its cold weather shelter, that he would find money to help keep the facility open until June. Now, Mayor Filner, where will the city find the money and how much is available? You know, I have been concerned about veterans homeless for a long time. I mean, I was chairman of the Veterans Committee in the Congress. Uh, I wrote the legislation that said nationally we should have no veterans on the street. Uh, I, w I was uh, talking to many of those uh, homeless over the weekend, saw people on breathing machines who would be literally left out uh, overnight without access to medicine and the ability to, run, not, to plug in their machines, and on and on. So I said, we have got to find the money to keep it going until the end of the fiscal year at least. Uh, and so I will be asking the city council this week to um, to uh, take about two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which uh, we have in uh, we have as a part of a little surplus that we had for this year's budget, and apply it toward this uh, humanitarian need that we have toward uh, those who have really defended us in time of war. Let's not put them out in the street again. And you're also. Uh have extra money for the regular homeless shelter as we, well. We have put in money to, previously uh, to try to, to keep the, the, those shelters open. Look, we have uh, uh, nine or 10,000 homeless on the street in San Diego. We don't have anywhere near the kind of uh, uh, beds to house those people. We need to do better. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do better. Uh, we're going to be the first city, I hope, to get all veterans homeless off the street in, in the United States. I think that's uh, the least we can do in this military town. In other news, the Fair Political Practices Commission says it's going to investigate how the UT San Diego charged for political ads uh, last year. Uh, KPBSI News Source report found that the paper charged higher rates for Democrats than for Republicans. Uh, what's your take on that issue? You know, we're not surprised by it. You know, we, uh, we, we, uh, we, when we looked at uh, the way these ads cost and how much people were spending, that didn't add up. But this is really vital for our democracy. We have campaign laws. I don't think they're tight enough, but or strong enough. But they have to be, there has to be early and full disclosure. There has to be tough enforcement and tough penalties. Uh, and I hope the Union Tribune uh, experiences a real tough fine for this because it really threatens our democracy when we have uh, these illegal actions. What if they had actually worked? That is, if the ads uh, that were illegally charged for d led to my defeat. 
I mean, you have no recourse after that. So we have to send a message that this kind of illegal activity will not be tolerated and people will face a heavy fine because it really threatens the basis of who we are as a, in a democracy. Okay. Uh, looking at some of the other issues, you're about to release your 2014 budget. Uh, it's your first budget as mayor. Uh, is, it still, is the city still dealing with a multi-billion dollar deficit? Well, it, it turns out in this uh, first year we were, had a, a, I'll say a, a, a deficit that was willed to us of about $40 million. Uh, our, our future in the third, fourth, and fifth years for, has much brighter outlooks and uh, revenues we project going up, so we'll have uh, surpluses uh, projected. But I have to get over that uh, this, this first hump. And uh, so we're going to use a combination of, well, increased revenues and, well, I'll tell you, one-time uh, revenue that we have in our budget to, to make sure it's balanced. We'll have a balanced budget. But we can do a, a, a better job if the council gives us the authority to negotiate a five-year budget deal with our labor uh, unions. That is, a five-year deal gives us greater flexibility, gives labor peace, it saves money. But it does one more important thing. It gives us, in the first year, $25 million dollars almost free money because of a calculation of our pension payments and $25 million in the second year. So I could balance the budget without the, the, the use of, uh, without the recourse of going into reserve funds if I can get a five-year budget deal. And, Eric, it fulfills the promise of Proposition B where we said we'd have a billion dollar savings because of a five-year pensionable pay freeze because of that Prop B. Prop B is in legal, uh, legal limbo. It'll not be resolved for years. But we can fulfill the promise with a $1 billion savings. So I, uh, the council has not, been very been, has not been very enthusiastic about a five-year deal. I hope when they see the budget savings and the promises that we can deliver on to the voters that they'll, that they'll approve eventually a, a, a five-year deal with our employees. Okay, just really quickly now, uh, Donna Fry is going to be leaving your administration. Does that change your commitment to open government? No, I, you know, I was really excited that Donna was part of our early administration. She, uh, she, she established new uh, web pages, for example, that fulfilled our commitment to open government. But that's a continuing process. Uh, Donna was the best for it. Uh, she's going to be in charge of a statewide organization uh, dedicated to open government. Uh, I hope that uh, we, I know that we will continue her efforts. Uh, we will have other people. But uh, my commitment to open govern, government uh, was inspired by Donna Fry, but uh, we will continue it. San Diego Mayor Bob Filner, thanks very much for joining us. A funeral is being planned for Margaret Thatcher, Great Britain's first and only woman prime minister. Thatcher died today after a stroke. She was 87, known as the Iron Lady, serving 11 years as prime minister. Thatcher was a divisive figure in British politics. Her admirers saw her as a savior who laid the groundwork for an economic resurgence. Critics say she ushered in an era of greed. She's also remembered as a staunch ally of President Ronald Reagan. PBS NewsHour will have much more on the life and legacy of Margaret Thatcher tonight at 7. Actress, actress Annette Funicello also died today. One of Walt Disney's first child stars, she was an original Mouseketeer in the Mickey Mouse Club and made a string of teen beach movies in the 1960s. In 1992, she announced she had multiple sclerosis. A year later, she created a research fund for neurological diseases. Annette Funicello was 70 years old. Camp Pendleton is investigating a Marine sergeant videotaped in a road rage incident last week. Another Marine took this uh, video after a fender bender on base. Now the Corps says it's investigating for potential legal or administrative proceedings. Some who know the sergeant say he suffers from PTSD. If the Secretary of Defense gets his way, military commanders will lose the ability to reverse criminal convictions for their personnel. Pentagon sources say Chuck Hagel wants new rules after an Air Force officer overturned a guilty verdict in a sexual assault case. If the legislation is passed, commanders could only act in minor cases that don't involve a court-martial. This is the 50th anniversary of the Federal Equal Pay Act. Although there's been progress, women are still earning less than men for the same job. Peggy Pico finds out why. 
The Federal Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963 when a woman made 59 cents to every dollar a man made for the same work. Today, women earn 77 cents for each dollar earned by men. My guest, Joanna Scuvoni, president-elect of the Law Lawyers Club of San Diego, is here with details on why there's a wage gap, the surprising long-term losses, and what a woman can do to get salary equality. Joanna, thank you so much for being here. Tomorrow's National Equal Pay Day. What does that actually mean? So, Peggy, Equal Pay Day is the day in 2013 that women have to work to earn what their male counterparts earned in 2012. In other words, it takes us 99 days into this year to earn what men earned last year. For the, for the whole year. One of the missions of the Lawyers Club, which is a 1,000-member local bar association, yes. I understand, um, is the advancement of, for women's status in law and society. What types of occupations are we talking about where women are getting paid less than men? Is it across the board? Is it lawyers? Is it uh, people working in restaurants? You know, Peggy, it's women all across the wage spectrum and education spectrum. Women are earning less, no matter their education, no matter their profession. Um, this has to have long-term consequences. The Wage Project, I know, estimates that on average, a woman earns about $10,000 less per year than a man for the same work. They also found that compared to men, over a woman's lifetime, uh, career, I believe from age 18 to 64, high school graduates earn $700,000 less. Female college graduates earn about a million dollars less than their male counterparts. And accumulatively, professional graduates uh, earn about $2 million less than men with the same degree doing the same work. What is the long-term implications of this sort of discrepancy? Well, in, in the short term, it means that women can't afford groceries and rent and health care and basic life necessities the same as men. But then in the long term, it means that women can't adequately save for retirement. We know that women outlive men on average, and one of the most vulnerable populations in San Diego is elderly women. They, more elderly women live in poverty. And so we know that this is, this is a long-term problem for women's self-sufficiency and economic security. It trickles out years and years, as Absolutely. we saw down the line. Now, it's been five decades since the Equal Pay Act uh, passed. Like many women, I'm alarmed every time I see the data that in 2013, women still earn 23 cents less per dollar than a man does doing the same job. Why? The question is, why is this still happening? Yes, that's right. That figure is alarming, 77 cents on the dollar we earn. And there are sort of two main root causes here. There's direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination is controlling for all other factors, education, uh, knowledge, skill, experience. Women, that 40% of the gap in pay is attributable to direct discrimination. So women are just paid less for the exact same work. And then indirect discrimination is things like implicit bias, workplace policies that are not family friendly. We also have um, association bias. People hire and promote people that look like them. And so there's lots of indirect discrimination that attributes to women being paid less. What about the idea that women just don't aren't negotiating? We won't go in as much as a man to say, I want more money. That is part of it, but it's not, as I said, it's not the whole picture. But one of the things that, that we can do is arm ourselves with information, right, Peggy? Information is power. And so negotiating is really important. How can a woman legally find out how much she's making uh, compared to her male counterpart? Well, there are resources where women can research salary information. There are websites including salary.com, payscale.com. They can go to their university career office and ask for comparable information. But right Right now, we don't actually have federal legislation that protects workers and allows them to ask their employer for salary information. And that is what the, Fair, the Paycheck Fairness Act is all about. And where does that stand right now? So the Paycheck Fairness Act died last year in the Senate. It actually passed the House. It's been reintroduced in Congress this year. It has 43 co-sponsors in the Senate, but it needs more bipartisan support. What are some practical ways women right now, tomorrow, can start uh, trying to increase their salary? Well, like we discussed, they can educate themselves about salary. They can take a negotiation workshop and go in and negotiate on their own behalf. Organizations can publicize the data about the pay gap. I think that you and I are alarmed. I think that your viewers are, will probably be alarmed. We need to know more about this so we can fix it. Well, I want to let viewers know on that note that we have a lot more information on our website at kpbs.org, and we have links for this equal pay and what can be done about it. Joanna Scavoni, thank you so much for talking with us.
Should baby food jars come with a warning label? An environmental group is suing to get the jars labeled. They say there's a small amount of lead in jarred baby food, and state law requires the labels. Baby food makers say yes, there is naturally occurring lead in the jars, but the amount falls below federal labeling requirements. Lead exposure can damage a child's developing brain. Southern California Edison has officially applied for permission to restart one reactor at San Onofre at 70 percent power for two years. At the same time, state lawmakers are introducing a bill to let ratepayers see the true cost of running the nuclear plant in the longer term. It would require California's Public Utilities Commission to consider all future costs before agreeing to charge customers under a license renewal. San Onofre's current license runs out in nine years. State lawmakers have also advanced a bill to restrict certain types of school bonds called capital appreciation bonds. They caused controversy in the Poway Unified School District last year because of a repayment plan costing 10 times the amount of the loan. Today, the Assembly passed a bill limiting the debt to four times the amount owed. It now goes to the state Senate. School districts use the bonds to finance construction. And seasonal firefighters and air tanker crews from Cal Fire are getting ready for what's starting to look like another dry, hot summer ahead. Ramona is home to one of Cal Fire's four air attack fighting bases. Its small air traffic control tower was built in 2004, and it's among 149 facing closure under federal sequestration cuts. But the FAA delayed the closures last week until June 15th to deal with mounting legal challenges. It does have an impact should there be any delays or problems, but the key is we're not going to be leaving. We're still going to be here. We're just going to adapt how we get in and out of here if those closures take place. CAL FIRE does have a system, a call when needed, where we can actually bring in a portable tower and FAA qualified um, controllers. We've done that during large fires in other parts of the state, and we could do that at this facility or any of the other facilities we needed to if the need arise. CAL FIRE is urging homeowners to clear brush from around their homes to create a defensible space. The county disagrees with the closure, saying it removes a layer of public safety. It costs the federal government about $540,000 a year to staff the tower. Brownfield in Otay Mesa has also been spared temporarily. The delay comes amid a debate over the necessity of towers at smaller, less used airports. It seems like a contradiction. A new report says airline quality is up, but so are customer complaints. The report from Purdue and Wichita State Universities says complaints were up 22 percent last year, but more flights were on time and there were fewer baggage problems. The top five U.S. airlines, Virgin America, JetBlue, AirTran, Delta, and Hawaiian. The mighty Moo is back in San Diego after 13 years in Japan. Mighty Moo is the nickname of the USS Cowpens, a Navy cruiser. While the ships have been based in Japan for 13 years, the crew hasn't been gone that long. The 400 sailors left Japan on the newly upgraded USS Antietam back in January. They swapped ships and brought the Cowpens back to San Diego. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, as President Obama visits Newtown, Connecticut, we look at the range of gun control laws in states across the country. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. Californians have a new way to try their luck. Powerball tickets went on sale today for the first time. Jackpots for the multi state lottery start at $40 million. The lottery says Powerball will maximize the amount of money they can raise for California schools. Our first Powerball drawing will be on Wednesday. Today's blustery weather is supposed to clear out by tomorrow, and we're looking for sunshine along the coast, partly cloudy for the inland valleys, and temperatures are supposed to start warming back up. We're also looking for sunshine in the mountains the next few days, and desert temperatures climbing back into the 90s. Recapping tonight's top stories, the California Fair Political Practices Commission says it's reviewing reports saying UT San Diego may have violated campaign election rules. The agency wants to know if the newspaper offered an improper discount on political ads during last year's election. An analysis by iNewsource and the KPBS Investigations Desk found a political action committee paid just over $1,500 for 16 full-page ads critical of Bob Filner. Filner's campaign consultant says the paper quoted him a price more than five times higher for one full-page ad. The chief of the Fair Political Practices Commission says discounts are allowed but must be reported as in-kind contributions. The UT says 
Political ads were part of a bundle option available to every campaign. The paper hasn't commented on the commission's review. A winter shelter for homeless vets is getting a two-week reprieve thanks to the Veterans Village of San Diego. The shelter on Sports Arena Boulevard was supposed to close today. The city still has to decide whether to keep it open longer. City leaders have already extended another shelter downtown. And one of Walt Disney's first child stars died today. Annette Funicello was an original Mouseketeer in the Mickey Mouse Club, and she made a string of teen beach movies in the 1960s. In 1992, she announced she had multiple sclerosis. A year later, she created a research fund for neurological diseases. Annette Funicello was 70 years old. And the Iron Lady of Great Britain also died today, Margaret Thatcher, who served 11 years as prime minister. Thatcher was a divisive figure in British politics. Her admirers saw her as a savior who laid the groundwork for an economic resurgence. Critics say she ushered in an era of greed. She's also remembered as a staunch ally of President Ronald Reagan. PBS NewsHour will have much more on the life and legacy of Margaret Thatcher tonight at 7. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.